All right, we have the opportunity um, at this point to, if you have a device or a Bible, I'd like you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. So if you're uh, even relatively new to the Bible, um, you will find that uh, in the New Testament, not the Old Testament. And there are four Gospels in the New Testament. Those are the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So the third book of the New Testament, Luke chapter um, 15. Now, uh, we looked at, just a moment ago, a parable of the Pharisee and what we call the publican or a tax gatherer as part of our confession time. Now, um, for the preaching this afternoon, I'm drawing your attention to Luke chapter 15, where again, we find a parable, and it's typically called the parable of the two sons. In fact, that's how Jesus introduces it, parable of two sons. And you got a younger son, and you got an older son, and both of these sons represent two different kinds of lostness. And both of these sons need God. Both of these sons need Jesus. Both of these sons need to live and flourish in what we call this here, the Father's house. Well, we're going to look at the second son in our second service, but the first son, we are going, the younger son, we're going to be considering now, he is known uh, more traditionally, and maybe you've heard this term before, the prodigal son. And I don't know about you, but uh, when I was younger and having been reared in the church, I remember hearing oftentimes about the prodigal son, but I never knew what prodigal meant. Prodigal just simply means a son who's kind of lost his way. We call a wayward son, in this case, a rebellious son. And he's a son who left the father's house but needs to get back to the father's house. And he does do that, but how does he do that? We're going to look at that here uh, this morning. So, Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 11, and he, referring to Jesus, said, There was a man, really a father, who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, Give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had, and he took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Do you notice how the story ends? We like a story that ends well, don't we? You ever watch a movie and and somehow when it gets to the end, it just kind of leaves you hanging on somewhat of a dark note? There's not too many movies like that, but sometimes you'll find that and it just kind of leaves you kind of empty and like, oh man, I I was hoping for some form of redemption, some form of freedom and release. Sometimes you have that. But this is the kind of story that ends on a high note, ends on a good note, right? Son actually comes back home, and he lives, and he flourishes in the father's house, and they celebrate. However, that's not how the story started, right? 
we're going to look at the story. But first, I want, to, I want to bring this quick thing out to you. About 100 years ago, there was an African-American preacher named James Weldon Johnson. And um, he wrote a poem. And at one point, he incorporated that poem in the sermon. And the poem goes like this. Young man, young man, your arm is too short to box with God. You left your father's house, and you're on the way to Babylon. Now, if you know anything about the, Bob, uh, the, the name Babylon, Babylon refers to a city in a country called Babylon, a country where our ancestors, the, the people of faith, the Jewish people of the Old Testament, found themselves enslaved. But, but Babylon, in a larger sense, in a symbolic sense, reflects all that is out in the world, all the, the magnetism of the world and the... the, the the, the difficulties of the world, the temptations of the world that just kind of like magnets suck us in. So he says, young man, you're, you've left your father's house and you're on the way to Babylon. Smooth and easy is that road that leads to hell and destruction. It's downgrade all the way. The further you travel, the faster you go. No need to trudge and sweat and toil. You just slip and slide and slip and slide till you done bang up against hell's iron gate. Oh, sinner, when you're mingling with the crowd in Babylon, drinking the wine of Babylon, running with the women of Babylon, you forget about God and you laugh at death. Yeah, today you've got the strength of a bull in your neck and the strength of a bear in your arms, but one of these days, one of these days, you're going to have a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with bony death, and bony death is bound to win. And so, young man, come away from Babylon. Leave the dancing and the drinking and the gambling of Babylon. Leave the wine and the whiskey of Babylon and those hot mouth women of Babylon and fall down on your knees and say in your heart, I will arise and I will go to my father. Young man, young man, it's just got to, you can kind of, when you use your imagination, you can kind of see maybe this big African-American preacher with this deep, resonant voice telling this poem that almost sounds like a song. It's got the rhythm of a song. And he just says, young man, young man, referring to the young man here in our passage. But see, here's the thing. Who is this young man? You know, Jesus tells this story and because it's a parable, usually parables are short stories, and Jesus leaves a number of details out, which kind of sparks our imagination and our inquiry, and kind of go, well, yeah, what about this? What about that? Like this young man. What about him? I mean, listen, we don't, need, we don't know his name. We don't know um, the, the, the background history of this man. We don't know why. He left his father's house specifically, what the trouble was. And we don't know really how old he was. I mean, when you read this story, what do you think? How old do you think he was? Maybe 17, 18, 19, 20, maybe? And you think about it, what is it, what is it about? I mean, I mean, obviously he's old enough to get an early disbursement from his dad and enter into the world and find out what the world's all about. So you, you, you look at this young man and you say to yourself, well, okay, what is it, what is it about that, that age where you just kind of want to bust out? Now, if you're here this morning and you're like 10, 11, 12 years old, something like that, you're, I'm going to tell you right now, you're not, you're not going to understand this young man so well, but here's the thing, soon you will. <laughs> you will. And if you're 18, 19, 20, late teens, early 20s, you're going to, you're going to get it. You're going to get why this young man wants to probably leave his father's house. And if you're middle-aged and older, when you start getting a bit more reflective, you're going to look back on that time when you were in your late teens or early 20s, and you go, yeah, I know exactly what that young guy was going through because that was, that was me to a certain degree. Here's the thing. When you're around that age, you want to bust out. You want to get out from under your parents' wings. 
especially if you grew up in a home that wasn't real stable, or maybe your parents were going through difficulties, you were not really cared for, or whatever, then you realize, yeah, I want to bust out, I want to get out on my own, but whatever, whatever the case is, it's entirely natural to get up from your parents' wings and launch out into the world on your own. You grow up to do that. Okay, but it, it's, it's not okay, however you grew up, it's not okay to leave your parents' house in a state of rebellion. And, and this was the issue with this young man. He left in rebellion. You say, well, wait a minute, I, where, where do you read that? Well, here's the thing. You notice that when this man left his dad's house, the father's house, um, if you look at the passage carefully, he, the passage says he went out into a distant country. It just didn't say he, he, uh, like he went from Abbotsford here to Chilliwack or to Hope but this is, this is a young man, if he lived in this area, he's the one who crossed provincial lines. He's the one who headed out to Saskatchewan or Manitoba or Ontario or even further to Quebec or the Maritimes or what have you. I mean, he, here's the point. He wanted to get as far away from his father's house as possible. Okay, that's in here. That's in his heart. And here's another interesting thing as we move on in the story. So this guy can actually live for a time in the world, he requested an early disbursement of his inheritance from his dad. And here's the thing with the story too. The dad acquiesces to that. He says, okay, if you want an early disbursement, I'll give you the early disbursement. You don't get any sense in the story that this young guy says to his dad, hey, can I have an early disbursement of the inheritance? And the dad says, well, why is that? Well, I want to go out. I want to, I, want to, I want to live out on my own. And dad's like, well, you're not ready for that. And I, you, know, you want an early disbursement? How much do you want? No, no, no. I don't think so. There's none of that. For the purpose of the story, Jesus tells us that this dad gave his son the early disbursement of the inheritance. And what did the kid do once he got out to a distant country, which we don't know what country that was, but is far away? He burned through the inheritance. Just like that. He burned through it with what the Bible calls reckless living, which uh, according to the poem of James Weldon Johnson, he probably spent on the wine, women, and song of Babylon. He it seems like he probably partied it away. And um, yeah, that, that, was, that was a problem because coinciding with that, if you look at the story, a famine hit. Now, when you're young, you probably have heard the word famine, but you go, what, what is a famine? A famine is where um, there's a lack of food, probably because of some form of drought or flood. We don't know, but that means that basically what Jesus is telling us is that this young man, while he was in this country, experienced some difficulty and a lack of food, and this is what we would say, the economy went south. So you have these two things coinciding. The economy went south, and that's when you need cash reserves. But this young man is not living according to the Dave Ramsey plan, okay? He burned through the inheritance, and now he's got no cash reserves. And so what does he have to do? Welcome to reality. You got to get a job. So he got a job. Where was that job? <laughs> well, it was a stinking job, <laughs> a bad job. At least it was a job. And I'll get to that a little bit later, okay? But for now, I want you to notice something in the passage. Um, if you get your device or your Bible, take a look at verse 16. Here's his job. He, was, he got a job feeding pigs, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs were eating. But here's this phrase. It's very, it's very important for us to understand. It says that no one gave him anything. <laughs> so he burns the cash reserves. He's got nothing. He's hungry. And nobody in this country, nobody in the world is coming alongside of him and giving him any kind of assistance. You know what the interesting thing is? When you're part of the church, when you're part of the family's house, what happens when you and I go through difficulty together? Hmm? We help each other out. Right? The Bible says when one person rejoices, that whole body gathers around that person and rejoices with that person. And when that person goes through difficulty, the whole body, at least is supposed to, is to come along that person and help them out in some way. But this young man left the father's house. So he's, he doesn't have any safety net. What is Jesus' point? Jesus is saying, listen, 
the wine of Babylon, whiskey of Babylon, those women of Babylon. <laughs> it's all illusory. That is, it's, 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 it's all a bunch, of, it's a bunch of lies. The world beckons us in. Come on, come on, you know. And here's the thing. The, the world, okay, you got to realize this when you're younger. Okay. And I'm telling you this is now in, in middle age moving on to an older man. And those of us who are middle aged and older, again, you get reflective and you look back, and we will all agree, all the middle aged people here and all the older people will agree, that the world, it promises you pleasure, but oftentimes it only gives you pain. Especially if, if you don't have God in the picture. It promises you pleasure, but it gives you pain. It promises you freedom, but only brings a certain form of enslavement. Oh, it, 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 <laughs> it promises you in some ways, it promises you heaven, but it only gives you hell. It promises you so many things, but where does it leave you? I'm telling you, it can leave you in a bad place, it can leave you in a, a place of emptiness, what our passage here refers to as essentially a pigsty. So when you, when you enter into the world without the church, when you enter the world and experience the world without Jesus, right, it's a slow death. Let me give you a quick illustration of that. There was a philosophy press, professor years ago named H. Evan Runner, taught uh, university students, and at one time he gave him this very simple illustration. It's like a child's illustration. He says, you got, you got two old women, and one of the women... Uh, invited the other, uh, one of the, uh, the older women, uh, invited the other older woman into her home, I don't know, for coffee or tea, whatever. So this lady shows up one afternoon, and this lady who owns the home welcomes her into the living room and just says, hey, just have to take a seat. I got to get back into the kitchen. I got some coffee brewing. I'll get us some tea or whatever. And so she starts putting stuff together in the kitchen and leaves this one older, other older lady in the living room just kind of sitting there. And as she's sitting there, she notices this simple uh, uh, fish bowl with a single big goldfish in it. And she goes over to that bowl, and in a moment of impulse, she puts her hands in there and cups that fish in her hands and takes it out and puts the fish on the ground, and she says to the fish, Oh, poor fish, I'm going to give you the freedom that my friend never gave you. Now, if you're younger here, and you can imagine this, you're thinking, well, what happened to that fish? You know what happened to that fish, right? The fish is flipping and flopping all over the place in the carpet, and eventually those gills go in and out, and eventually the fish expires. The fish dies. Now, why does the fish die? Because what that older lady did is she took the fish out of the environment which God created for that fish to survive and to flourish. God created the fish for water. God didn't create you and me for water. He created you and me to breathe the air that's in this world. Here's, here's Runner's point. He said, when, when, when you and I leave the Father's house, we're leaving the environment which, which God has given us for us to not just survive, but to flourish, to experience joy and peace and meaning and purpose and all of that. But you leave that, you're like the fish. You're flipping and you're flopping and it's a slow death. Well, you get back to the story and this is this young man. Okay, he's, he's facing this situation. And so he's out in the world. He's away from the environment of the father's house and things are not going well for him. And so what does he do? He has to get a job and he gets a job feeding pigs. Now, you think about it, this, this job feeding pigs, I suppose that wouldn't be... Uh, our desire for a top job when we think, well, what do I want to do with my life? Well, I think I'd like to feed pigs. You know, I mean, but that's where he's at. Now, I want, to, I want to submit to you that this young man may have been a Jew. Why do I say that? Because you've got to understand the audience to whom Jesus is speaking to here. He's speaking primarily to Pharisees and scribes. Uh, these, are, these are religious, Jewish religious leaders, and he's trying to get their attention. And so it could very well be that Jesus is 
seeking to illustrate this point in an end-around way to these Pharisees and scribes, these Jews, saying, listen, this young man, scribes and Pharisees, you know shouldn't be associated with pigs because if you look at the, the, the first two-thirds of this Bible and you read the Old Testament, you read about the Jewish people and you read about the religious practices and you realize that Jews were not to be associated with pigs because they were considered not just physically but ceremonially unclean animals and they were to stay away. They were not to touch pork. They were not to eat pork. Even today, Jews and Muslims will not eat pork. They're unclean animals. So if this young man is a Jew and he's working with pigs, what's Jesus' point? Jesus' point is really simple. This man started in the father's house and he's going down, 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 down until he hits rock bottom. <laughs> it's usually only when you hit rock bottom <laughs> and you become empty that you begin to see your need. If you weren't raised in the church and you came to faith later on in life, or if you're in the process of considering the claims of Jesus, this is what God's going to do to you if he hasn't done it to you already. He's going to remove things from your life, here and here and here and here, until you hit rock bottom. And if God is drawing you, that may be a painful thing, but ultimately it's an expression of his love because he's going to change you. Okay? And that's what happens to this young man. So he hits rock bottom, okay? And, and then... The passage says this. Look at verse 17. It says, he came, he came to himself, which is really tight with the original language here. In other words, as we would say today, as he hits rock bottom, he realizes that this cannot go on. He, he, comes, he comes to his senses. As we would say today, the lights turn on for this young man. And he comes to this point of uh, intense self-realization self-awareness and we know that he comes to this point of self-awareness because of what he says now verse 17 but when he came to himself he said how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread but here I am I'm dying of hunger right I'm perishing with hunger so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rise and I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Now that last part here, I'm going to bypass it for now. I'm going to get to it in just a moment. So this young man comes to the end of the road and this intense time of self-awareness and he figures, I got, I, man, I got to get back to the father's house. What is the path to the father's house in this story? Should I tell you what it is? It's very simple. Listening? Repentance. Repentance. Now, what is repentance? Repentance is, as one man put it, repentance is coming clean with God. Repentance is, as one man put it, his name was Gerhardus Voss, he said repentance is a return to sanity. Theologically, repentance consists of these three things. Let's have a catechetical moment here. Three, three C's. Contrition, conversion, confession. You want to make it to the Father's house, you've got to have those three things. Contrition, conversion, confession. Contrition is where you, you come to the end of the road and you, you feel a certain measure of guilt in your life. And you become broken. You know what the Bible says? That a broken and a contrite heart, O oh Lord, you will not despise. You've got to get to that point. You become broken. Then what do you do with that brokenness? You, get, you, you become converted, and conversion just simply means a turnaround, what I call an about face. You're going in this direction, you move 180 degrees in this direction, and this is what this young man does. He goes from the pigsty back to the father's house, and then finally, that all results in confession, something that comes out of the mouth, and here's his confession, very simple. And your confession doesn't have to go on and on and on and on. It can be very simple. He says, listen, and this is his point of self-realization. I have sinned against 
heaven, that is, I've sinned against God and I've sinned against my Father, I will return. I will go back to my Father's house. So they all three involve certain parts of our being. Contrition, heart, conversion, will, confession, mouth. So the road to the Father's house, again, is repentance. And should I tell you what I have found out many times as a pastor in working with with individuals inside the church and also outside the church is that sometimes you get individuals who, who do come to the end of themselves and they repent and they want to come to the Father's house. But you know what you also get? You get people who would rather die than repent. And this, is, this has always troubled me because when you hold out to them life that comes through the re, to repentance, they'll say, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. I ultimately would rather have my autonomy and my own self-rule and living my own life and doing my own thing, even if it leaves me in a pigsty, I'd rather have that than repent. One other quick illustration of that. A number of us have heard of... Um, uh, a female who was very prominent in the rock scene in the mid-60s to late-60s. Her name was Janice Joplin. And Janice Joplin grew up in a little town, I'll be brief with this, grew up in a little town called Port Arthur, Texas. And according to the story, if you do a little research on this, her dad, I think, was an engineer, and her mother was, was a, actually, well, she was a stay-at-home mom, but she was also a Sunday school teacher. And at 17 years old, Janice Joplin said, I've had enough of little town Port Arthur, Texas. I'm tired of my home. I'm launching out on my own. She became the prodigal daughter. And so she left her home, and she went on her way to a distant place called San Francisco. That was her Babylon. And she got caught up into the scene there in the mid to late 60s. I mean, San Francisco was the hotbed for the, for the, the hippie autonomous movement, right? She got all caught up into that. She became a very popular singer and was known nationwide. She was on TV shows and all of this kind of thing. Yeah, this little girl from Port Arthur, Texas. And when people would look at Janis Joplin, they would see all kinds of life and energy. And if you ever heard her sing, I mean, she just belts out. There is something in her, a certain kind of boldness. But here's the thing. If you would really sit down with Janis Joplin and just try to enter into her heart, you would realize that there was a lot of pain there. She was bullied when she was younger. She had a bad complexion. Guys on college campus, when she was in college for a while, I believe it was in Austin, Texas, would make fun of her, look more like a boy than a woman, you know, and these kinds of things. And that stuck with her. And that kind of bullying and other things that were going on in her life, particularly lifestyle, just brought her really deep inside a lot of pain. In October 4, 1970, Janice Joplin was found in her hotel room with her face down on the ground, lying on the ground between her bedstand and her bed, and uh, she had died of a heroin overdose. Now, when, when she was younger, she was known as a sleepwalker, and one night when she was a little girl, she got up in the middle of the night, and she left, uh, went through the front door, and her mom heard her get up, and her mom followed her, and Janice went off the, down the steps of the house and crossed the lawn. She was going to enter into the street. And the mother called out to her, and she says, Janice, where are you going? There's no answer. Janice, where are you going? And Janice, still sleepwalking, responded to her mother, and she said, I'm going home. I'm going home. And Mama said, Janice, home is here. Come back inside the house. Now, Janice, when she got older, here's, here's my point. She never really made it home. She never really made it home. And there's a lot of people like that who never really, really make it home because they really truly haven't come to the end of themselves and repented and confessed their need for God. Well, this young man is essentially saying, that's not going to happen to me. So he decides, as we start ending the story now, he decides to go home. And, the, and you know, since he went in a distant country, okay, he's got a lot of time to think. It's many, many kilometers back home. And he's, you know, no doubt he's going through this confession in his mind, Dad, I've sinned against heaven, I've sinned against you, I'm not worthy to be called your son, I'll be your slave, and that kind of thing. He's got a lot of time to think. 
So he's walking and he's walking and he finally gets within sight of the house, but it's, it's from, a, from a distance. And the story tells us that the dad was outside and that the dad sees his, his young, this young son of his, sees him from a distance. And, you know, I've, I've illustrated this here before, but again, you know, you don't, you don't get a dad who probably be with, like a lot of dads here, where he kind of, you know, be like this and looking at his son thinking, hmm, yeah, wow, well, you know, I'm thankful at least that you're alive. But, uh, man, you know what? You didn't text, you didn't email, you didn't communicate for all those months you were gone, and now you're coming back home. And let me guess, you probably burned through the inheritance, you've come to the end of your rope, you need monies to live, and you need some security, so yeah, now you're coming back home. And is that how the father reacts in this story? The father sees his son from a distance, and this tells you everything about this dad. He, he... Do you notice in the passage, it should, it should catch your attention, it uses the word compassion here with the Father. So the Father is a, not a retributive spirit, but he's got a compassion of spirit. And, and he just, he, out of impulse, he runs to his boy. He runs to this, this young man, son of his, and what does he do? He embraces him and kisses him in time. He puts a ring on his finger, his shoes on his feet, and a robe on him. All of this stuff. And he eventually throws a party for this son. And, I mean, it just shows you that this, the, this, the, what this father is all about. Now, I want you to notice, getting back to what the son says. Now, on two separate occasions, the son says, I'm going to go to my father, and I'm going to say this to him. Father, I am not, I've, I've offended you. I'm not worthy to be your son. I will be your slave. I will work for you. Now, I want us to meditate on this. This is a very significant point. What, what do you think the son was really saying there? What was going through his mind? The son's thinking, I really ticked dad off. He's really upset. And what I'm going to have to do is not just assume that I'm going to come back home and dad's going to put his arm around me and throw this big old party for me. What I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to somehow, bit by bit, work myself back into the good graces of my dad. And if I just am willing to work hard enough and prove myself enough, then my daddy will love me again. Then, he will, then he'll treat me like the way that I was before I left the father's, my dad's house. Now, I want you to notice, the re what, what did the father say to his son? As his son starts putting out this spiel of, Dad, I've offended you, and I've done this, and I'll be your slave, and so on. What does the dad say? What does the text say? He didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. And yet he says everything. Not with his mouth. But with his embrace. It's like just... Whatever. I see that you're repentant. I see your heart is in the right place and I receive you in. Now, why is this a very significant moment in the story? Because it reveals something about a heart of our Heavenly Father, doesn't it? I'm going to say something right now that's going to seem too good to be true, but it is. Okay? Your Father in heaven is more willing to forgive you than you are willing to repent. And He is far more willing to receive you and embrace you than you are willing to come to Him. Okay? Why is that? Because our Father is a God of grace. And if you know anything about grace, grace refers to the unmerited, unearned favor of the Father. The Father says, yeah, you've messed up, so if you just do this and this and this, then you can come back home and I will, I will love you. The Father looks into our heart and as long as he sees repentance, as long as he sees need, as long as he sees us saying, you know what, I, Jesus, I need 
you. It's the full embrace there. So, you know what? There's, in the end, this is what the parable teaches us. There's only two places you and I can live. Babylon, the world, or the Father's house. Jesus or no Jesus. Church or world. But you, you can't do that. Okay, so you can't do this. You can't go, eh, here's one foot there and one foot there. Jesus does not allow that. It's either or. Which world are you going to live in? Okay. Now, the prodigal son, he learned out what the world was all about and he ended up in a pigsty. Jesus comes to us this morning and says, if that's what you have chosen, you don't have to choose that life. Jesus says, in this beautiful invitation from the Bible, he says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden with your sins. Come, into, come to me, all you who are just stuck in the mire of Babylon, and I will give you what? Rest. I give you rest. So, you may be skeptical about this. You may say this is a bunch of hooey or I don't know. Yeah, nice story, but I don't, I don't, I, I, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. Yeah, but you know what? You're here. <laughs> You've chosen to be here. You may be a wandering son or daughter of the church. And you may be in the process of walking away, what we call de-churching, or maybe thinking about it. Okay, but you're here now. You may be, mmm, boxing God. But let me tell you something. Your arm is too short to box with God. And you, we all realize, right, you try to box with God, that is a contest you will never win. You just won't. But here's the thing. You know what the prophet Isaiah says? Your arm may be too short to box with God, but God's arm is not too short to reach out and save. So with that having been said, wherever we are at, whether walking with God right now or somewhere out here in the world to various degrees, the Lord says, whoever you are, don't look down on other people. We're all in the same boat. Together we fall short of the glory of God. And Jesus extends that invitation to us every week. He just says, come. Come to me. And as we do, as we come repentantly and believingly and just say, Jesus, I need you. It's then, it's then where we hear from our Heavenly Father, oh, this son or daughter of mine who was lost, well, now they're found. The son or daughter of mine who was once dead now now they are alive praise God that's the kind of God we serve we're going to pick up on the story a little bit later on in our second service before we do let's pray together Heavenly Father thank you that you are that kind of God to us a father who just out of the impulse of your gut out of your heart extends compassion and reception and forgiveness to all those who humble themselves and draw near to you. Lord, give us that kind of humility in our hearts. Help us all at the end of the day just to say, Jesus, I realize I do need you. And Jesus, I recognize that only through you can I experience true joy and life and flourishing in this place the Father's house. Bring us to that point, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.